it's uh, sentimental for me to be back, not only because uh, it's great to see all of you uh, whom I know and love, and some of you I remember too. And, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> as was mentioned, I was uh, summer vicar here in 2003, and I pulled up on a beautiful uh, day in May, it was Ascension Day, and uh, you were having something very similar to this. Maybe some of you were here. Uh, when Daniel Preuss was presenting. Anybody remember that in 2003? Yeah. And uh, he was preaching that night at the Ascension service, and I sat down next to my buddy Chris Raffa. Many of you remember him. Remember little Chris? <laughs> yeah. Chris, uh, Chrissy. Yeah, Chrissy. Yeah, yeah. He's a pastor in Wisconsin now, uh, near Travis. And uh, in she walked. <laughs> and she and uh, both of us were watching as she walked down the aisle, uh, her golden brown hair glinting <laughs> by the gleam of the, the altar candles, you know. And, uh, I leaned over to Chris and I said, who's that? And he leaned back and said, I don't know. <laughs> Of course, we both thought uh, she was hot, and she was. Uh, was a little warm in there. And uh, uh, we didn't talk most of the summer, although there are other parts to this story, but it's going to cost you a couple of beers if you want to know. <laughs> um, which, apparently, if we're Icelandic Lutherans, that's the way to go, right? We can sing the hymns and everything. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about marriage, and maybe we can begin with a word of prayer for marriage. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, at the creation of Adam and Eve, you instituted and blessed marriage as the union of a man and a woman, and commanded that it be held in honor by all. Grant your blessings to all married couples, that their life together may be blessed with wisdom, purity, self-sacrifice, and love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, what I'd like to begin by doing at something that Lutherans love to do, and that is complain about the state of the world these days. And so uh, let's think about marriage and sexuality, and that's kind of where a lot of the hot button issues today are, aren't they? Right? So let's just put some of this on the board. If you're to, to diagnose the problem, let's start with some of the symptoms. So, what are some of the symptoms in society? Homosexuality. Okay, homosexuality. And along with that, we might put... Uh, the acceptance of. Acceptance of, right, yeah. Uh, gender identity. Yeah, gender identity. Single parents, single mothers. Okay, yeah. Which, of course, uh, uh, that's one more step removed from some of this, right? Because it's not a... Uh, sin in and of itself to be a, a single parent. There may be any number of circumstances that have led to that, but it is certainly uh, a result of all of this. So, single parent. What else? What was that? Divorce. Yeah, and and maybe uh, actually. So, a lot of people have have uh, who have given this some thought have backed this up to. Uh, the advent of no-fault divorce, right, which uh, sort of goes hand in hand with uh, the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s, which we're still trying to, to figure out uh, the fallout from all of that. Okay. Welfare. Welfare, yeah. Uh, please, Debbie. Well, I don't know how you're going to get this all right now, but yeah, those who uh, should get married do not want to be married, and those who really shouldn't be married are insisting on getting married. Yeah, I don't know how we're going to get that all right. <laughs> Did y'all hear Debbie? So some people who should get married but don't want to get married, and other people who should not marry each other but insist they're going to. Is that that's that's basically it? I'm not going to write all that up. Yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody said the uh, shacking up. Yeah, living together outside of marriage or cohabitation. We'll say, which that, by the way, that's a big one because one of the things that uh, I think pastorally most of us 
uh, nowadays encounter is people in our in our congregations kind of know, yeah, that's sinful, but it's just not a big deal anymore because everybody does it, right? Yeah. yeah. And and along with that one, uh, we could put. Uh, uh, I'm going to make some some distinctions without a difference here, maybe. Uh, but uh, fornication, which is technically okay, this is. Uh, Sex before marriage, okay? Adultery, technically, would be uh, sex with someone outside of your marriage, but you, you know, not to the person you're married to. You're married, but not to the person. Uh, so when we adulterate something, we're mixing a new thing in, right? So we're, we're adulterating the marriage, we're bringing a new thing into the marriage. Please. Redefining what marriage is? Yeah, what, just what is it, right? Yeah. Or is it anything? Which uh, is kind of one of my, my going to end up being one of my main points. Uh, we could go on and on, couldn't we? This is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but one of the things that you, uh, if there's a common thread through any of this, uh, it is the question, does marriage and sexuality, which for us hopefully still goes to, together, right? Okay. Does it belong to God or man? That is to say, uh, whose institution is it? Who gets to define it? And one of the things that you uh, will note as our society uh, begins to embrace all of these things and more is that actually, uh, as, as a culture, culturally, we're not uh, trying to bring greater clarity to the meaning of marriage. We're trying to say that it's meaningless. And why? Because if it's meaningless, I can do with it whatever I, I please. But it comes down to this, and uh, of course, uh, so if God is the institutor of marriage, what does that mean? He gets to define it for us, right? On the other hand, if, if man is the institutor of marriage, and we could put... We probably should put uh, up here uh, government uh, mandate on, you know, what is it, how do we do it, and that sort of thing. Which, by the way, there's a good way in which to understand this, and there's, then there's also the government interference in this. But if man has instituted marriage, then man gets to define it. And if man gets to define it, what's objective about it? Because your definition may be different than my definition, which is different than her definition, which is kind of the way we think about things anyway in the 21st century, right? This is called relativism, okay? Uh, well, believe it or not, this is nothing new. And uh, actually, Luther, when he writes his marriage booklet in 1529, is addressing what I would like to suggest is the mirror image of these issues. It's not the same issue. Uh, but what it is, is it's, it's sort of the reflection. You know, when you look at yourself in the mirror, how you're a copy of yourself, only you're entirely backwards. Okay, so how was marriage and sexuality viewed in Luther's day, in 1529, when he writes his marriage book? Anybody want to take a stab at this? Please. I think there's a lot more cohabitation than you think. Well, probably that's one thing, is yeah, absolutely, underneath the radar, right? Yeah. But cultural attitudes toward that thing is still kind of like, well, it's not acceptable. But what would the church, what was the church saying in Luther's day? Marriage is good, it's a sacrament, right? Uh, according to Rome. But it's not as good as celibacy, right? So if you really want to be holy, then you do the sacrament of holy orders, which is to say you're going to take the vow of celibacy, among other things, and become a monk or a nun or a, a priest. And one of the things that Luther does in the Reformation, maybe we should have said this when we were going back and forth in, in terms of Luther's contributions uh, to the world, is he upheld marriage and sexuality as things that are holy. They're from God. They're a holy call. Uh, which, so the, the reason I'm saying this is a mirror image is that with all of our 
different challenges that we face here that we wrote on the board and are saying that, that marriage is essentially meaningless, that man can define it however we want. Uh, we're once again making marriage profane and sexuality profane, which is exactly what happened in the Middle Ages and one of the things that Luther, Luther had to address. And uh, my contention would be that in the midst of all of these challenges, uh, might be good for us to go back and review what Luther had to say in his marriage booklet. The marriage booklet, uh, written four years after Luther was married, so he figured he had something to say after four years. He was married uh, June 13, 1525. The marriage booklet comes out in 1529. Two other important documents come out from him, at least two other important documents come out from him in 1529 the large and the small catechism. The marriage booklet and the baptism booklet are originally a separate uh, publication, but what happens very quickly is the printers, we heard about them in a previous presentation, it was nasty printers, but they did something right, and that is they began to uh, append them to the small catechism. So the marriage booklet was simply published together with the small catechism, and uh, Luther did approve of that. He thought that was a good idea. Uh, so uh, what is it? Well, uh, Luther begins by saying in the marriage booklet, many lands, many customs. So what this is not meant to be is a one-size-fits-all liturgy uh, for the marriage rite. But it is intended to say, uh, what is it that's important that we say to the couple and that we proclaim to the church when we have a couple present themselves for, for marriage. I actually think one thing you could do, pastors, is adopt the marriage booklet as sort of your pre-marriage catechesis. Because what happens is uh, evangelicalism, big E, right, as we've talked about it, has all sorts of advice for, for married people, for marriage, and most of it's pretty good. But what they don't do is they don't back up and talk about a theology and that's what Luther does in his, in his marriage booklet. Essentially, what he's going to have us do is look at a series of texts from the scriptures. And so we'll go through those here in a minute. But what we want to do when we read Luther is look at the theology of, of marriage. What is it as God's institution? Okay. Which what that does is sort of wipe the slate clean of all of this other stuff and focuses us on... What does God have to say about it? Um, so uh, in light of these assaults on marriage, uh, here's the marriage booklet. And uh, I'm just going to, you know, this is kind of funny because uh, you have before you the, the handout that I gave you. And there's a website uh, underneath the title there where this was originally published. Now, what I've given you actually is my unedited version. If you want a better version, go look at what the editor did online, just go to that address and it'll be there. But the other thing that you can do is uh, Google Luther's marriage booklet and you can find it for free on the internet as a PDF. Mm. Or if you uh, have volume 53 of Luther's works, you can find it in there uh, and the Cole Wingard edition of the Book of Concord has it appended to the, to the small catechism. The first thing that Luther does may surprise some of us. And that is, he talks about marriage, first of all, as a civil contract. And you know, uh, we think uh, when we, we're going to attend a wedding, good church wedding, we're going to march down the aisle, the pastor will be up front, and uh, that's wonderful. But we don't often stop to think about the fact that the pastor is not just acting as uh, the pastor of the particular congregation but as a civil servant in this regard. He's going to sign some legal documents. He will witness the, the couple signing legal documents. Uh, and those have to go on file at the, uh, well, it was Secretary of State in Michigan. I haven't done a thing here. I don't know where it was on file here. But um, uh, the point is, is that there's a civil element to this. And uh, what would happen in Luther's day, and this is where he starts in his marriage booklet, Anybody know where the wedding actually takes place in Luther's day? Well, could, yeah, it could be, but uh, usually it's at the door of the church. It's outside, at the door before you even enter. 
And uh, so this is where the pastor is going to get his uh, uh, civil responsibility over with. And that begins, Luther says, even prior to the wedding day with the publication of the bans, B-A-N-N-S, the bans. What are the bans? I don't know that we exactly do this anymore. Put in a list of... Okay. <laughs> well, uh, so um, Jack and Vivian, I'll use their name because of my previous congregation, they were my favorite couple I ever married because they were both 80. When I married them. The best thing was when we talk about uh, the purposes of marriage, we go through, and one of the purposes is procreation. You know, if God so blesses you with children, so I read that part in the ceremony, and then we both just kind of stopped. <laughs> had a little bit of a laugh, but then I reminded them that Sarah was 90. <laughs> I'll never know. Uh, but Jack and Vivian want to be married. What happened uh, in Luther's time is then the pastor announces from the pulpit, and I, and I believe this would have been in writing as well, the pastor announces from the pulpit, say, the week before, that Jack and Vivian desire to be married. If anyone knows of any reason that they should not go forward with this union, getting back to what Debbie said, then this is the part where speak now or forever hold your peace, right? Which is popularized then in movies and in our culture as that moment during the wedding where the jilted lover runs in and stops everything and the bride runs away, right? Uh, but... <laughs> That's not good pastoral practice. That's not when we want to know that the wedding shouldn't go forward. We want to know that ahead of time, right? And uh, the reasons wouldn't necessarily be a jilted lover so much as, uh, well, uh, we know that this, uh, this uh, couple is related to a forbidden degree, or uh, Jack was irresponsible and uh, got some other woman pregnant and has not fulfilled his, his duty to her. Whatever the objection might be, we want to get all of that over with before we're going to enter the civil contract of the... So does anybody know why this particular civil contract should not be ratified? That's, the, that's essentially what we're doing with the bands. Then the couple comes to the door of the church, and uh, this is where the pastor will have them recite their vows, which are very important. They're contractual, aren't they? Right? Uh, will you have this man, will you have this woman uh, to be your lawfully wedded wife? And uh, this is also where they're going to promise things like for better or for worse in sickness and in health, right? And so the good and the bad. And one of the things that we've identified up here is that if marriage is essentially meaningless, then we really can only, all we have to promise is we'll be with you through the, the better, right, and the health, uh, and the richer, okay? Um, but we don't have to promise that when things get difficult that we're going we're gonna to see it through. Now, I began with a romantic story, but this is where I tell you that romance essentially has nothing to do with it. That's not quite true. <laughs> But in some ways it is, because here at the door of the church, they're making a contract that is legally binding, and Luther doesn't have the same problems that we have in terms of separating church and state. So Luther even has a Bible verse to go along with it, right out of Jesus' mouth, right? Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So if it's the worst part, Stick it out. You got to stick it out, right? If it's the poorer part, you stick with the person. And uh, the thing about marriage, and we've just got to get away from this idea that it's always uh, that when your heart is going pitter pat and that sort of thing, that feeling can be there. And it was for me in 2003 when I met my wife Sarah. But then again, did I love her yet at that moment? I was in infatuation with her at that moment, which is a good thing, right? You know, uh, I think maybe we ought to make a distinction between infatuation and lust, which are two sides of the same coin, but those are the feelings that go along with 
with love. But if we were to define love, what is love? Sacrifice. Sacrifice, yeah. Commitment. Commitment. Yeah, I think we want to get away from thinking of love in any sense as a feeling. Because feelings come and feelings go. Love is a decision that gives birth to action for the sake of the beloved. I'm going to say that again. Love is a decision that gives birth to action for the sake of the beloved. And Jesus is the model here. And one thing we know about Jesus' love for us, his love is a decision for us that gives birth to action, sacrificial action, action as President Lindemann says, uh, for the sake of the beloved, even when the beloved is not lovable. And here's the point, and we'll, we'll get to this when we get to the, the, the scripture passages here. There are times, and we need to be upfront with this, with, with newlyweds, there are times when you have the opposite feeling about each other <laughs> than you had when you came to the Ascension service and Daniel Price was preaching. <laughs> you know, um, and uh, you know uh, there are things that well we'll get there we'll talk about this but, um, so if we define love as a feeling that's you know that's when we tend to, to cut so you made a contract out by the, the door of the church that's when you would exchange rings and that is when the pastor legally says of the couple you're now husband and and wife. Then we come into the church building. Now, by the way, I'm not suggesting that we start doing this this way, although maybe it would be helpful. I don't know. Um, but it's simply to say, one thing we want to understand is this is both. The legal part is important. Why is the legal part important? Because when you, when you have a marriage, oftentimes, other than Jack and Vivian, what, what is the product of that marriage? Children. children and the children need mom and dad to be committed to living with one another as a stable family for their sake so that they can be raised in that context with a, with the mom and a dad who love them and love love one another and so uh, because we're all fallen sinners and because we're tempted when things get rough to run away now we have the legal contract that binds us together and uh, movies always teach us, right, everything is catechesis. The, if, if the church doesn't catechize, if the parents don't catechize, the world will catechize. And one of the things that the world catechizes us to think is, when we're no longer in love with one another, that's when, for, for our own sake, for our own self-fulfillment, we ought to, to separate. And that it's better if we're not in love with one another it's better if we don't stay together for the kids. Well, I'm all for staying together for the kids. And sometimes you don't want to stay together, but you do it anyway. Because you made this commitment to one another. Of course, there are all sorts of uh, exceptions, to, and I'm not judging anyone's particular story. right? Uh, but the general rule is you stick it out. And uh, if you fell out of love, Fall back in love, right? Just You've got to make this decision that for the sake of, of the beloved, even when they're unlovable, you will sacrifice yourself. And this is one of the things that the texts we'll get into will say. Well, the part you've all been waiting for, though, is the second part of the wedding, when they come into the church for the divine blessing upon their marriage. St. Paul says, I wish I could remember the reference, but I can't in 1st or 2nd Timothy that all things are sanctified by the word of God and prayer and so when we join a Christian couple together we want their marriage to be made holy to be sanctified by speaking God's word to them and praying over their marriage praying for that couple and as we did just a few moments ago praying for marriage in general among us and uh, so Luther does uh, something which I think is quite important. Uh, one of the things we don't have in our marriage right as it stands currently is there are suggested readings, but there are not prescribed readings. And that's probably a good thing. We want a little bit of freedom here. 
But one reading that I think should just about always be in it, and I always highly encourage people to have this, is what we might call the words of institution for marriage. And uh, so, uh, tell you what, uh, anybody have a Bible with you? Anybody that has a Bible willing to read? This is the thing with the Lutheran sola scriptura. Yeah, but you want me to read the thing? <laughs> so, okay, well, you, okay. So I'm going to assign some readings. I'm going to give you the chapter, but not quite the verses yet. So Genesis 2, if you would, Debbie, who else? Uh, uh, can I have you look up Ephesians chapter 5? I need uh, Genesis chapter 3, please. And uh, one more, if I may, Kim. Uh, Genesis chapter 1. Judy, I'll give you one too, since you wrote it. Raise your hand. Uh, Proverbs 18, please. Now, the first thing we have are these words of institution for marriage. And so, Debbie, if you would read chapter 2, verse 18, and then verses 21 to 24. And all I'm having us do is read the, the texts that Luther assigns in his marriage book. Verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Verse 20. Uh, 21 to 24, please. Verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Uh, can, go ahead and read the next verse, too, because we're fine. The man and his wife were both naked, and they, fell into no, and they felt no shame. That's not the one I was thinking of. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you read it. I was erasing and maybe not listening. What What are the words of institution for any... What does that mean? Words We talk about that with regard to the Lord's Supper or baptism. What are words of institution? Those are the words that the Lord gives to give the thing, right? To start the thing. So, in other words, what we're saying, simply from the fact that God is the one who gives who gives the instruction, gives the command that the man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, that says that marriage has its origin from which one? God. God, right, exactly. And uh, a couple of things about that wonderful text. This is why I think we ought to read it uh, during the marriage rite. Number one, it identifies a need and we tend to think of the Garden of Eden pre-falls, everything is just pie in the sky, wonderful, right? And it is, for the most part, but there actually is something that Adam is lacking. And what is it? A help him. Yeah, it is not good. Because everything's good, the Lord has said, right? After every day, the Lord saw that it was good, and at the end of the creation, he saw that it was very good, but there's one thing that is not good, and that is that the man should be alone. Therefore, I will solve this problem. I will make him a helper who uh, complements him. Corresponding to him would be a, a good way maybe to translate uh, that verse. Not And corresponding, by the way, not just physically, although that's true, that's natural law, and that is a little bit of a hint about uh, how God intends marriage to work, right? But also, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know this, but apparently it does these days, and that is that men and women are different. Not just physically, but emotionally, mentally, the way we think about things. And, and even, I would contend, spiritually. And, and this uh, gets into uh, what Pastor Lang was bringing up, bringing up about dads and about uh, what Luther says in the Catechism about how the head of the household should teach it uh, in a simple way to his, his family. Um, whereas uh, maybe uh, the dad is to be, uh, and we'll talk about this here in a second, uh, what it means to be the head of the family. But uh, uh, dad perhaps is the instructor and he's the one that says, uh, 
you know, get up, son, we're going to church, it's time to go, right? You know, and there's not a lot of compassion there, maybe. I'm speaking in generalities, and maybe this is just how it works in my house, I don't know. <laughs> but mom is more nurturing, right, you know, and both are important in terms of handing on, on the faith. And in spite of the statistics, we should say, I think Pastor Wayne would agree, mom should still come to church, right? Uh, <laughs> he was not suggesting that mom should stay home and only dad should take the kids. Uh, but uh, uh, both parts are important. And uh, so I will make him a helper corresponding to him. Um, and then what's interesting, and this is not part of the text that Luther prescribes here, but what happens immediately after he makes this determination? Yes. We have the parade of animals actually first. And it, you know, and why? Why that there, of all places? Well, uh, first of all, Adam is naming them, right? Which is not to say that Adam says, "Okay, Rover, Sparky, Bob." <laughs> that he's actually he's doing biology, he's doing science, he's classifying animals, he's studying them, and uh, you know, uh, he's uh, noticing things about them. And one thing he notices is there's a Mr. Buffalo and a Mrs. Buffalo. There's a Mr. Rover and a Mrs. Rover. And he looks and he says, what? Where's mine? Where's mine? Yeah. And then, and this is absolutely beautiful. God puts Adam into a deep sleep and takes from his side. And the word is side. Not, this is neither here nor there. But it's, it's side, not rib. My bed is rib. But the word is side. And he forms out of his side the woman, the one corresponding to him. And uh, this is an absolutely beautiful gospel. Because what happens in the new creation is God puts our new Adam, our Lord Jesus, into the deep sleep of death, right? And then what happens? The centurion does what? Pierces his side and outflows blood and water, uh, which we might say, in terms of application, fills the font and the chalice. And the bride of our new Adam, Jesus Christ, which is to say what? Church is born, baptism, and nourished the Lord's Supper from what flows out of his out of his side. And there you, and, th and this will relate to the rest of the readings because when we get into the Ephesians one here in just a second, we're going to find out Paul says, you know, this is the controversial one we've encountered already uh, about uh, wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives. And then Paul says, I'm telling you a mystery, but I'm actually talking about what? Christ and the church. Not that I'm not talking about husbands and wives. I am. Paul's, you know, he's, he's telling husbands and wives what they are to do. But ultimately, he's speaking about something even greater, which is to say, say Christ and the church. So there we have the words of institution for marriage. Then he, he does Ephesians 5, but he does something interesting with this. And so uh, if you begin by reading us verses 25 to 29. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. And then if you jump back and read us verses uh, 22 to 24, please. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. What is interesting about this is Luther switches it around. Paul has his reasons for doing wives first and husbands second. 
but Luther has other reasons for pulling the switcheroo and doing husbands first and wives second. And why might that be? I know we're not supposed to do speculative theology, but go ahead and speculate. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, uh, <laughs> depending on your gender, one of two things probably happens when you hear wives submit to your husbands. And then, by the way, your ears stop, regardless of your gender. Wives, submit to your husbands. We don't listen to the rest as to the Lord. It just goes on, right? Uh, what happens, uh, uh, you men, when you hear that verse? Yeah. yeah. And this has happened to me, in a, in not in my current congregation, but it has happened to me when I have tried to explain this verse to my congregation, uh, some of the men, which, uh, uh, by the way, they're all great guys and they treat their wives very well. But you know how they do, they jokingly high five one another like, yeah, yeah, right, submit. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it doesn't mean, men, that you're the boss. The other thing it doesn't mean is everybody loves Raymond Beer Marie, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Trust me on this, that does not work. And, uh, <laughs> but what does it mean, actually? Well, this is why Luther starts with the word to husbands, because what we're going to find out is a, a Christian wife's submission to her, her husband flows out of something that happens prior to that, which is uh, the love that the husband gives to his wife. And the reason that that's important is because, as Paul says, this is going to be a picture of Christ and his bride, the church. And where does the church's submission come from if not flowing out of the Lord's sacrificial love for the sake of his beloved, his holy bride, the, the church? Um, but the other thing, of course, is that in our cultural context is uh, if you're a feminist, you hear those words and immediately you shut your ears. Why? Because somehow St. Paul and the church are saying that women are inferior to their husbands. And that's simply not the case. And one of the, the things we have to remember when we hear this text is that this has nothing to do with superiority or inferiority. And in fact, it's not even really for all women. It's for Christian women who willingly place themselves under the headship of their husband. Not because anybody's holding a gun to their head to do so, but because they get to be, as Paul says at the end, the living picture of Christ's bride, the church, as she submits to him, which means receiving his love. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And uh, though I, I'm not necessarily going to unpack this totally right now, uh, I get this from uh, Ernie Lastman in Seattle, who's... Uh, was my vicarage, my full year long vicarage uh, supervisor, and also was the senior pastor when I was called uh, to my current call. But the, the, the headship of the husband and father means at least three things, okay? It means that he's to protect. And that means that uh, when my wife hears a noise in the middle of the night, I don't get to say, well, you better go check that out. <laughs> no. And, you know, to be serious about it, it is to say, if somebody's got to die in this relationship, if somebody's got to die in this family, it, it falls to me as the husband and the father first to be the first one that gets it. And then, of course, it falls to her because she's the one corresponding. She's the helpmate. Right? So... Uh, this isn't to totally excuse her from all response, but it is to say, look, men, step up, go die for your wives. That's what it takes. You make the ultimate sacrifice, you make all the sacrifices, and if, it calls, if, if you're called upon to die, then that's what you do. The second thing is, I should have mentioned this ahead of time, but this is a totally politically incorrect presentation, I Sure you do. So, uh, get ready to be offended, okay? Uh, the second thing is, is provide. Now, this, I, I'm not saying that women shouldn't work or that uh, in some cases women aren't the sole provider of the family or things like that. 
Um, in fact, when I was a uh, fourth year seminarian, after I had married Sarah, uh, I sent her off to work. And our joke was, because I had a little part-time job, I brought home the bacon, because that's all I could afford, and she brought home the rest. <laughs> um, but it is to say, if she could not work for some reason, if she had lost her job or something, uh, the, the ultimate responsibility for that does not fall on her shoulders, it falls upon mine. And if that means I had to quit school, then that's what it means, okay? So it's not that she can't be the one that works, uh, and I just bring home a little bit, uh, but it does mean that finally the responsibility falls upon me, okay? And that's part of that first one too, right? That's part of the sacrifice uh, that is called for in love. And then the third thing would be uh, leadership, and particularly spiritual leadership. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we all know that this doesn't work the way it ought to in this fallen world or in the church, but uh, dads, you've got to bring your kids to church. You've got to be the one. Uh, you've got to step up in that regard. And uh, there's some practical wisdom, though, here too, isn't there? I mean, we can't both ultimately be the leader, right? Someone will be dominant in the relationship in terms of setting the tone of the way our family goes. Now, that doesn't mean that anybody's the dictator. Nobody's the boss. And if, if we've learned nothing else from, from the passage, it is that the husband actually is the one who is to sacrifice uh, for the sake of the wife. And that not only includes dying for her, but uh, men, I'm sorry to tell you, if your wife is sitting here, she's about to learn something that you don't want her to know. And that is that if there's a conflict about which channel we're going to watch, probably, probably you ought to get a second TV so you to watch. Um, okay, but the key here again is that the Christian husband and the Christian wife become the living icon of Christ and his holy bride, the church, as they live their vocations in the world, which is to say, you are a living witness to the faith. You are evangelizing. And, and, and actually, so to go back to what we wrote on the board at the beginning, Christians are always, we're always worried, right, you know, we've got to vote the right people into office, make the right laws, and, uh, you know, fix things, right? Things are a mess, let's fix it. And uh, that's not going to happen this side of heaven, not the way we're imagining it. We're looking at all the wrong saviors. But one thing that we can do as Christians is to model what marriage ought to be in our own relationship. And now, we're not going to do this perfectly. We're going to make all sorts of mistakes. We're getting to that. Okay. Uh, but it is to say that your marriage itself can become a picture of Christ and the church, which the world will see. And once we get that theology right, then we can beg, borrow, and steal from the evangelicals about all the wonderful practical advice they have to give about, about marriage. Okay, uh, the third text... This one might strike you as odd, but Luther prescribes it to be read in the marriage, right? Genesis chapter 3. I can't remember who had that one. Please. Uh, verses 16 to 19. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Though painful, through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since it is from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. All right. So, in other words, Luther says that we ought to read the curse. <laughs> well, you know, I'm all for being a pessimist. 
because uh, one thing about being a pessimist is you're never disappointed. But sometimes you are pleasantly surprised. And, uh, but the reason Luther would have us read about this, uh, the, sort of the fallout from sin, is uh, two things that we need to keep in mind. And this is, again, back to what we want to tell our newlywed kids. You know, if we had one word of advice for you, it is you've got to stick it out for two reasons. This is a fallen world, so things will go wrong. You are fallen people. Fallen things will happen in your marriage. And whatever your idea is of what, what marriage is supposed to be, it will not be that. And among other things, marriage is work. And it just is, and you have to put it in. Part of the commitment thing that you had mentioned earlier. Yeah. The second thing is, there is a cross to be born in marriage. Which is to say, it will be hard. It won't always be the better. It will sometimes be the worse. It won't always be the health. It will sometimes be the sickness. It won't always be uh, the richer. In fact, it may often be the, the poorer. Right? And uh, uh, this one, and uh, I hesitate to even mention it, but it's very important. The biggest cross of marriage is that it will end. One of you will bury your spouse. And that is the hardest cross. And uh, as we talked about, though, you know, God is hidden in that suffering for the sake of the beloved, which is to say, for you. And the church buried her spouse, and then he rose again. And your spouse will rise from the dead because he's risen. Right? Uh, okay, finally, uh, Genesis chapter 1. Who had that? Kim, please. Uh, verses uh, 27, 28, and 31. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and of every living creature that moves on the ground. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Uh, so here are some promises for marriage that, that God uh, gives right in, in Genesis chapter 1. First of all, he creates man in his image. We've had a great uh, study on that. He creates male and female and gives his blessing to that uh, complementarism, to coin, coin a phrase, right? Complementarity. Is that a word? That's not a word either. All right, because they fit together, right? you know? Uh, and that is to say, he creates man as male and female. So talk about gender confusion. God gives it to us right there. And then he makes some promises about it. He blesses it. It's interesting. It's a command, but it's also a blessing, right? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. I don't want this. Your other one's dead. Oh, here, you take this. <laughs> <laughs> what was I saying? I don't know. So yeah. Word. Fruitful. I was making up words. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. This is totally countercultural, right? But God actually says it's a good thing to be fruitful and multiply. Now, this doesn't say that every marriage is going to, Jack and Vivian did not end up having kids. <laughs> They're both still alive, so it still could happen, but now they are 90. <laughs> It's, yeah, so it's, <laughs> well, he's not quite 100 yet, so, you know, um, Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90. Anyway, um, having kids is a good thing. And this gets back to Janice's concern, by the way, right, you know, uh, we always ought to, every child is a blessing, a gift. And so the first thing we do to say to that young mother is congratulations, right? Not I'm sorry that you you, know, you messed up, uh, whatever. Uh, congratulations. And then the second thing that we say to that young mother is, we'll we'll be with you in this. And and certainly, yeah, go talk to pastor. And let's uh, 
make everything right that way too, but uh, we will be with you financially, we will be with you spiritually, we will be with you emotionally, we will support you. Every child is a blessing. And uh, that also goes, I've had a number of people in my uh, pastoral experience who uh, have had uh, a pregnancy with where something's not right with the baby, right? You know, we know there's going to be a cross to be born, a particular cross to be born. The first thing you say to that parent is congratulations, not, oh, I'm sorry, your kid has this problem. And then you say the same thing, uh, we'll walk with you uh, through all the challenges. But, uh, okay, uh, and then uh, fill the earth and subdue it. Uh, what's beautiful about this, and uh, I'm not trying to contradict uh, who was it was talking about, oh, it was Dr. Schultz, I think. Yeah, better not. <laughs> it, is he here? <laughs> from him. Didn't work, but. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it is to say that God uh, promises that in this institution which he's just given, he's going to fill the earth, so have kids, and subdue it, or rule over it, in other words, right? Reign over it. And uh, that tells you something about marriage's significance for society. That this is, in fact, the basic building block of society. Now, in the beginning, uh, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was what? Formless and void. In other words, it wasn't. It was a big chaotic mess, and it was empty. And now, here, through the vocations of husband and wife, he's going to fill it and bring order to the chaos. And that tells us a little bit of something, too, about what the new creation will be. It will not be chaotic. There will, in fact, what are the promises at the end of uh, Revelation about the new creation? There will be no more mourning or crying or pain. The old order of things has passed away. Behold, the new has come, right? And God will what? Wipe away every tear from your eyes, and there's the spouse you buried, risen from the dead, and living. Uh, okay, well, I'm just going to read you the last uh, two paragraphs of the thing that I passed out, and uh, then I'll be done. Uh, finally, in the right, pastor and congregation commend the couple in their marriage to God in prayer, as we said, uh, all things being sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. Uh, we've had the word, now we're going to pray for the couple. So we beseech your never-ending goodness that you would not permit this your creation, that is to say marriage, your creation, ordinance, and blessing to be removed or destroyed, but graciously preserve it among us through Jesus Christ our Lord. And there's a recognition here that God preserves marriage as an institution by preserving concrete Christian marriages. Again, those concrete icons that are out there in the world, right? Okay? Marriage belongs to God and is His gift to man. In a context where marriage as God's institution is under assault, Christians do well to study Luther's words, which are really the word of God from Holy Scripture. God grant us to repent of our own abuse of marriage and sexuality. This calls for some self-examination here. For all of us are guilty of uh, sins against the, the Sixth Commandment, which doesn't just mean outward sins, right? But uh, what does Jesus say? He who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery with her, and that applies the other way, women too, just so you know. <laughs> uh, our casual acceptance of cultural mores, okay? Uh, allowing the culture to shape our views of marriage and sexuality, our flippancy toward the sacred institution, uh, flippancy, uh, and you know, uh, I'm not saying we should never joke about it, but uh, my go-to example is uh, back in the days when we had real sitcoms, remember with the family and everything, husband and wife and kids, what is the dad always? He's a buffoon, yeah, right. And it's hilarious and it works, but it's just not quite right. Um, 
And God grant us also by His grace, and here's the key, to live in the forgiveness of sins in Christ and believe His promises concerning the blessed estate of matrimony. That God is pleased with it, that was a big concern for Luther. Remember, we wondered if, if we get married instead of taking the vow of celibacy, is God still pleased with us? God is pleased with marriage, uh, and by it He fills and rules the earth. We should honor and revere marriage as God's holy will, promote it to our children. I might even suggest that we stop telling them to wait till they're 40 years old to get married. Uh, pray for its sanctity and model its holiness in our own relationships. To this end, God help us. Questions, comments, concerns, challenges? If you're going to challenge it, I give. Go ahead, you're right. <laughs> Pastor, come get your microphone and monitor. <laughs> <laughs> no questions? I was just going to thank him because I'm going to paint this, this verse on my wall. Whoever finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains a blessing well, that, from the I was Lord. supposed to have Judy read that verse. I'm sorry, oh. Judy. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Jolene took it. Well, our, well, I saw it. I said, that's going up on her wall. I was going to have her read <laughs> Proverbs 18, verse 22. This is Luther's paraphrase of it, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Whoever finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains a blessing from the Lord. Solomon took that a little too literally. <laughs> <laughs> Janice, please. So how do you witness life to a granddaughter who has three children and whose husband has left her for another woman, three children, abandoned her? You witness to somebody and, who's... and that she's probably feeling guilty that she didn't do part of marriage. I don't know. How do you? How are you from? Well, you, you do cry with her first of all, because this is she's broken. The marriage is broken. The husband who left is broken. The kids are now broken, and everything's broken, isn't it? And there's once again our suffering, and God is hidden in it. Um, and it. it the thing about the theology of the cross is it always looks hopeless. Everybody is devastated on Good Friday. And everybody's surprised on Easter. And so only, you, you cannot know this by sight. You can only know this by faith, that God will bring good out of this terrible evil. But you do acknowledge it as evil. And uh, uh, in terms of helping her with her guilt, the guilt is a slippery thing because there's false guilt and there's real guilt and there's probably some real guilt and there's probably some false guilt, uh, you know, in that situation. Uh, but the answer for both is very clear and it's the same and that's that Jesus bore all our guilt, true and false guilt, all the way to the cross and nailed it there in his flesh and buried it in his tomb and he's risen but your guilt is not. And that's why we can get up in the morning and care for the children and uh, love and serve uh, our neighbor. Uh, a big key thing though is, and, and I don't know if your granddaughter is, uh, goes to church here or anywhere, but uh, uh, try to hook her up with pastor. Ongoing pastoral care is very important there. But it, you know, as, as grandma, it's simply to love her, hurt with her and for her, what? Part of the cross that we have to bear, we talked about the cross in marriage. A big part of that, I didn't make a big deal, I should have, but when we read the curse is uh, mom is going to bear children and she's going to have pain in that. And that doesn't just mean the pain of childbirth. It does mean that, but it means the whole nine yards. It means forever, right? If you know that if nothing else as a parent, if, if it means nothing else, it means you're going to hurt for your kids. That's worse than a child. Yeah, it is. Yeah, imagine. Well, I don't know. I didn't. I've never born a child. But <laughs> I understand it hurts. But, well, but, that, but that, beyond, yes. That hurt that you feel for your child later in life. Yeah. Hurt, that's much worse than yeah. the pain that we side. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that that goes then for your grandchildren too, right? You you hurt for them. But but there is God in that suffering for you. And it's sanctified by Christ's suffering for you. It's redeemed by his suffering for you. 
you are redeemed and your granddaughter is redeemed and her children are redeemed by his suffering for you. What else? Anything else? Anybody? 